Thank you very much for uh, taking the time. I know there's lots of great sessions here and I really appreciate uh, you showing up and I hope that you enjoy this. Um, I, it's great for me to be here because of course I'm from Minnesota so it's nice to uh, come, come down here in this time of year and uh, now I know why the birds fly south this time of year. They're, they're pretty sharp. Uh, if you'd ever like to know why they fly north, you, I, Minnesota's really quite nice around July 27 to 30. You can be pretty certain that it won't snow right then. Uh, if you do happen to uh, come to Minnesota, it's kind of important to know how to talk and get the right accent in that and talk like the locals because you can get a local discount if they think you're a local. And uh, one thing, you know, kind of 101 on Minnesota is you got to be able to say the name of the state correctly. And it's pronounced this way, the Minnesota. You got to have the D, there is no T in Minnesota. And then uh, not to be confused with regular soda. Uh, the talk that I'm going to do today is uh, mathematics and the human experience. And I put a question mark on it because I, when I, it's one of those talks where I wasn't quite sure how this was going to go because when I originally went into mathematics, uh, math is, I, I like math because it's not subject to a vote or opinion. Uh, that's one reason why I went in. It's not really a democracy. It's, it's, you know, it's whether you can prove it or not. I like that. And unlike my theme papers, which of course I thought were great, but instructors never did, uh, math had right answers. And the other thing is those answers are still right. And I, I like that idea. And for, so for me a little bit, math and the human experience was kind of an oxymoron really, um, for a long time really. I was always kind of uh, uh, drawn towards the mystery. When I, when I was a freshman, I remember when I got, uh, you know, the function that gives you a position of a falling object and it gives you, you know, the object is changing position all the time and the velocity is changing all the time. And then they teach you, you can take the derivative and you don't get an average velocity, you get instantaneous velocity. And I, I thought that was amazing. Then you can take a second derivative and find out that the acceleration was constant. And it was just, it, it was, I, I really was drawn towards in awe of it, uh, using that example. Uh, there's also a lot of mystery, you know, like in equations, like E equals MC squared. It's such a simple equation, but, it, you know, and it's even, C squared, you know, but yet it predicted atomic energy. Something a little more recent is a guy named Peter Higgs. In 1964, he wrote a paper that was 79 lines long and four basic equations, and he picked, uh, you know, he found, uh, uh, predicted the Higgs boson, basically. And then they built this big collider, and in 2012, they discover it. And I, I find that very interesting, uh, the predictiveness of equations. You know, certainly there's beauty, there's art, all of that. You look at, uh, you know, well, why does such a simple equation as, you know, that for making a fractal, and, and you get such a beautiful design out of it, if you color it in the right way. And another one is also, you maybe have seen this, uh, you know, the golden spiral and the ear, that's going around now. And, you know, the, the Egyptians knew it, the Greeks knew it, and they built buildings around it, and you find it in nature, and there's, it, and, it, and if you follow that, you get structures that look very nice, and it's in nature uh, all the time. Much later, I learned something that you know, life is experiences, it's, it, you take it in really with your senses. But then you have words which are an abstraction of our senses. So in a certain sense, and I'm going to use this rather loosely here, language is not the experience, but we try to describe it. And I'm going to re refer to that a little bit as the first derivative of human experience. Now math is really a further abstraction of words. And math has this capability of really telling us, for instance, that the acceleration is 
constant. We wouldn't really quite understand that from the human experience. Um, e equals mc squared, it has that predictiveness. So I'm gonna call math a little bit the second derivative of human experience. And this idea here is not mine. It's, it really, uh, I got the idea from uh, this paper, Transcending Human Experience. Uh, it's an interesting paper if you like that sort of thing. He talks about math and this idea. Well, what can I learn from the second derivative? Well, m math is able to uh, look beyond what our senses can do. Uh, for example, we can, it can reach out really and bring back information that we wouldn't otherwise get. <clears throat> for example, if you think about higher dimensions, Riemann did higher dimensions uh, in the 1800s, and we really can't, it, through our experience, we experience three dimensions, and basically people don't think in higher dimensions, four, five, six, it's just not, our brains just really can't picture that very well. Well, doesn't everybody feel that way about math, right? Yeah. And you probably heard this one in the hallway. Uh, that's not, you know, the, doesn't everyone learn the way I did? You know, that's, that's, the way I, that's the way I learned it, so why can't they? Well, it's a little bit different. You know, today's students, a couple, some things are going on, and that is, unfortunately, we only have about 10,000 math majors a year that are U.S. citizens, and that's clearly not enough. <clears throat> and for most students, math is abstract, something to avoid, obviously, and uh, they really feel that math is, has, math has the image that it's for the gifted. Um, that it's a little bit of an exclusive club, that there aren't that many people, you know, most people don't get it, uh, you know, and you, you find that when you go to a gathering or something like that and you tell them you teach math. You, you know how that goes, right? We've all been there. So, can students relate? Well, that's definitely, they don't feel that that's them. And what's going on here? There, there's a book here, um, and some of these stuff will be available to you um, on website and stuff here, where math comes from. It's an interesting book. Uh, you may not uh, agree with all of it, but one thing that they're saying is that one reason it's been inaccessible is that sort of the cognitive structure of mathematics has gone undescribed. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when, when it gets presented, so we, when we present it in a textbook or something like that, what happens is, you know, we just see the definition, and even definitions aren't written in the sky, right? I mean, definitions you work at. You, you try to pick a definition that will help you, uh, you know, describe whatever you're doing. Then the theorem comes, and then the polished solution. And so, like, if you do, you know, the square root of two is irrational. It's, you've seen it all, I, I, most of you have here. And it's, uh, you know, contradiction, it's argument about even and odd and lowest terms and stuff like that. And then QED, and then they think, oh, is that quite easily done? You know, that you've all heard that too. Well, the, the, I think the creative part isn't always um, shown, even the struggle. Most of you have graduate degrees in mathematics here, and you, you, know, you know what it is to get a problem set and you spend all day on it, and you maybe get, I can remember getting one, I can remember getting none done at the end of the day and thinking, boy, I didn't get much done today, you know. It, there is a certain element of hard work and struggle really with doing mathematics. And sometimes when it's presented uh, a little too polished, that kind of gets lost. So how do the students react? Well, they're supposed to do math, but they believe they're not capable. So it, sometimes it results in a lot of That's my Halloween prank for, two. that was just yesterday, so. Yeah, math anxiety, right? Um, it comes out. I'm gonna play a little clip here. It's from, it's uh, uh, Patricia Heaton and, and Regis Philbin, Philbin and uh, it, it, it's a little clip. She gets a math question, and it's very classic how a person reacts. And there's two parts, so it's only about a minute each clip is, so. Here it is. 
Patricia, if a euro is worth a dollar fifty. Patricia, please stay with me. <laughs> Five euros is worth what? I am so bad at math. No, but wait a minute, you guys. When I get nervous. No. But Patricia, Ohio State. I that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> exactly my point. Stay with us. Okay. Okay, so five euros will be worth how much at a dollar fifty a piece, okay? I can't do the math. Would it be thirty quarters? No. Would it be fifty dimes? <laughs> Would it be 70 nickels or would it be 90 pennies? So Patricia, just think about it. I put everything on credit cards, Regis. I have no idea what this is. But 30 quarters would, would give you how much? It, I don't know. I have no idea. I literally, my kids, once they got past second grade, I could not help them at all with their math. <laughs> at all. Okay, then we got I a have problem. Got to, I have got to. Let's cut right to the chase. What lifeline would you like? I, I need to call my husband. Okay, so it's just a classic meltdown. Uh, of math anxiety and uh, she calls her husband and uh, it, they, they waste the 30 seconds and there's no answer still so now she's still on her own and then she starts to pull it together though here and then there's like another minute here I can't I gotta multiply it first in my head so a euro's worth a dollar fifty so five euros five times five is twenty five carry the two five and five six seven that means seven 50. So, I don't know. Yeah, no, wait a minute. You know this. 50 dimes is how much? 50 cents. 50 dimes? 50 dimes? Oh, it's $5. There you go. 90 pennies. How many pennies make a dollar? Okay, so 100. All right. 70 nickels. This is the worst question you're going to ask me. 70 nickels. How many nickels in a dollar? So seven times five, five that's three dollars and fifty cents. That leaves okay. 30 quarters. How many quarters in one dollar? All right, I'll give you my answer. <laughs> My answer is a three quarter. Okay, so she does finally get it. It's it's very classic uh, math anxiety, obviously here, and you, I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, is math anxiety real? It certainly is part of the human experience. And there's there's some new research that brain scans show that math anxiety prompts a response in the brain similar to when a person experiences pain. I, that was news to me. It's very recent. It's a 2012 article. Um, and the, uh, some of the things, it's the anticipation of doing the math. It isn't so much doing the math, and the anxiety is very specific to math and not to life in general. Increasing the number of homework problems does not seem to help. Um, Math anxiety is not necessarily an indicator of poor math ability. And writing about math, at least in this, uh, math anxiety seems to help a little. Okay, can, can we tell a different story? Do we have innate abilities in mathematics? Is it part of something that we're wired with? Okay, well, you're going to have a test here. You didn't know that, but there's a test. Okay. Now, you've got to watch the screen, and I think the projector will work here when it does it. You just tell me how many circles you see. Three, right? Okay, right? That, okay, let's try another one. How many on the next screen? Two, right? Not, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, one more. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it, I tried not to put a pattern to it. And, and the idea here is that there's an innate ability when you, when you start having one, two, three objects, and people can, and babies, and it's, it's, it's almost automatic. It's, it, and those, those uh, the screens were showing about uh, 50 milliseconds is the time I put on them. So it's going back pretty fast with it. It's almost boom, and you can do it. 
Uh, in general, if there's a higher number, it doesn't, it, it, people have a harder time with that as soon as it's more numbers. And now I, see, after I read this, I thought, oh, now I get it why some societies count one, two, three, and many. You know, if there's a herd of whatever coming at you, well, there's one, two, three, or there's a whole bunch of them. That sort of idea at a glance. Let's, let's try another one here. Another test. Yay, right? Um, is the circle in or out of the rectangle? That was easy, right? Pretty easy. Um, it was in, right? In or out? Uh, let's do one more. Out. That's out, right? And again here, that that seems to be an innate ability of people to tell whether something is in or out, or if an object's in, in the glass, it's in the glass, this sort of idea. And of course with mathematics, that's a fundamental thing. Are you in or out of the set? You know what I mean? Now granted, it's not that easy all the time telling membership, but membership it has a certain innateness to it. Uh, certainly if you think about Venn diagrams, uh, in a metaphorical way, we are really using, showing membership with Venn diagrams. I mean, circles, like if you think of people taking college algebra, people taking trig, that old one, I mean, circles don't really have anything to do with that and that membership, but it's a fabulous metaphor or a way of visualizing what's going on. We use it even in higher math. Metaphor is really a basic way in which humans understand abstract thought. That's how they get a handle on it. So we can have things like two lines meet at a point. A function f reaches its maximum. Five is larger than three. Some of these are very innate things. Do the points on a number line touch? That's actually a good question. <laughs> you know. Um, and the graph crosses the x-axis. We would sometimes use words like these and it's helpful. So what's the point? Well, metaphor is based on human experience, so mathematical ideas that use them can often be understood in everyday terms. Okay, let's think about the real numbers a little bit, and then we like to use the real number line. In a certain sense, the real numbers don't have anything to do with a line drawn on the paper. But yet, because we can put real numbers, we can order them. We, given two real numbers, if they're not equal, we can tell which one is bigger than the other, right? So then we can put them on the real number line. And it's a fabulous way, really, of visualizing the real numbers. And if you think about it, without it, we'd, we'd have a hard time doing analytic geometry, right? How about a unit circle approach to trig functions? You, you kind of need the unit circle for that. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of things, trig graphs, understanding trig in that, it's that idea of a number line. Uh, irrational numbers. People never uh, like new numbers, like, like a lot of things. For instance, um, you know, natural numbers, everybody accepted them pretty well. Zero was not around for a long time, right? Roman numerals, no Roman numeral zero. Why do you need something for nothing? Uh, is it an empty set? What is it? Negative numbers, they didn't like that. Irrational numbers, well, they accepted that because there's a physical length there, right? In a certain sense, that triangle has a hypotenuse of a certain length, and what is it? It's square root of two. So we kind of accept rational numbers. And then complex numbers were probably worse. Now you couldn't put them on a real number line, right? Because you can't order them. But then we could put them as an ordered pair and then we could use two number lines with it. And then we got a visualization of complex numbers. And then complex numbers get harder, right? Because you need a third dimension really to start graphing with them. Anybody recognize this one? This is really old. I, I thought, yes, <laughs> it's man, uh, man, woman, birth, death, infinity. He wrote it on the chalkboard. I apologize, that, that, that's a really old one there. Um, but there, infinity is an experience um, that seems to be outside the realm of human experience. And mathematics deals with infinity all the time. In fact, we, we feel like we got a pretty good handle on it. And I want to just talk a little bit about the metaphors that we use with that. 
Well, I think one of the most amazing things that Calc ever did is, is, is what? Grasp the idea of infinity. And the difference between algebra and Calc really, I think, is a limit. We, we, we run a limit out to infinity or we run it infinitesimally small to zero. And, and we get a result out of it. We get a convergence out of it. You know, if you think, well, how do we do the derivative? Well, we do it as a se like average velocity. We take a sequence of intervals and we make them smaller and smaller, right? And, and in the end, if we get a limit there, we call that the instantaneous velocity. We define it to be the derivative or the velocity in this case. If you take infinite series, this was an age old question. How do we get at that? You know, if I walk a mile, then I walk a half a mile, and then I walk a quarter mile, how far down the road do I get? Well, it's close to two miles, right? <laughs> if I can do it, but not over. Uh, how about if I walk, here's one, how about if I walk a mile, I walk a half a mile, I walk a third a mile, a fourth a mile, fifth, a sixth, how far down the road do I get? As far as I want, but it's gonna take me a while, right? Because <laughs> it's logarithmic. Um, but, it, but, and then why is that fundamentally different? Well, how do, we get a, how do we get at it? Well, we use partial sums, right? We add up the first n terms, we do it, and then we do it for a sequence, we do it S1, S2, S3, S4, on up, and then we look and we say, okay, does this converge? Well, it converge, it looks like it converges to two, because if you give me an epsilon, I can find an n that for all n bigger, the difference between two and Sn absolute value will be less than epsilon. How about infinity in Newton's method? Well, again, what do you do? You, you, you take a sequence of approximations and it approaches then two, right? Or a square root of two, excuse me. So again, we have a sequence of approximations that we, we get. So many times in mathematics, infinity is a sequence of steps towards convergence or however, unboundedness or whatever. And I think without this metaphor, I don't think I could teach calculus. I don't think I'd understand calculus without that idea. Now, one thing is, is that, uh, you know, you can train somebody to differentiate a polynomial and it's done all the time, right? But there's no understanding there. Well, where does this occur in life? Well, I guess, you know, in a way, walking. And then you might say, no, hold it. Now, when I walk, I always stop. You know, I never get to infinity. And you are, I, I agree with you, but it's, it's kind of like, well, how, anybody taken Newton's method to infinity? You know, no, I stop, you know, I stop early, right? And, or, or somebody raises their hand, still working on it, right? It's kind of expensive. <laughs> Takes a long time to take it out to infinity. Um, breathing is a repetitive thing. There's no strong sense of beginning and end, input, output, input, output, and functions, you know, kind of like sequences. One goes in, A1 comes out, two goes in, A2 comes out, and so on. And it actually, input output a lot of times works a little better for dom than domain range. I always found they had a little trouble with domain range. Not that we should give that terminology up, but the set of all inputs grasps a little bit better. So some of the mystery disappears around infinity, and we as mathematicians kind of understand that, what we mean by infinity and how we handle it when we use the idea of a sequence, a step, or metaphor. Metaphors are something that cannot be analyzed away, or they're just an aid for visualizing things. They are really an essential part of mathematical thought and development, and a natural part of being a human being. Uh, it, it's, it's a fundamental way at understanding. Math is an extraordinary system that makes use of ordinary tools in many ways. And all I mean by that is it's not magical. There's a tendency to believe that we pull the answers out of thin air. 
And there really is a lot of thought and work and structure behind it. That's what I mean by that. Implications for teaching. Teaching in concrete terms. A lot of math is developed in concrete terms, so it makes sense to uh, teach math contextually. And this, this is a little quote here. Students tend to concretize things and, and, and get as close to the concept as they can. Concrete to abstract thought is really metaphorical. Human beings conceptualize abstract concepts in concrete terms grounded in motor sensory system. If you take a step, uh, you know, like let's, let's just talk about teaching slope a little bit. Well, one way, a stairway, you could teach it in concrete terms that way. Rise, run, that there. Now, you don't need to do it that way. I do agree. That isn't the only way you can do it, and, and we've all done it different ways. But I would say it would be difficult to really teach it without the concepts of left, right, up, down. And you could train a person to do slope given two points, but there would be no sense of meaning there, no interpretation with it. It would be kind of like different, training them to do uh, differentiating a polynomial. You maybe have seen this one. It's just the fact that your coffee is always what? Too hot or too cold, right? It just plummets that little time there where it's the right temperature to drink. I don't think it's really accurate, but that's the way it feels anyway. That's my experience with coffee. Concrete to abstract. Moving from uh, social networks to rational functions. Uh, students know this one here a little bit, and I think, uh, will my um, pointer show up? Yeah. Um, what it's saying here is that on social networks, what happens is there's just a handful of people that do all the postings. So this bottom 80% does almost none of the postings. They're, they, sometimes they, they call them lurkers or whatever. They're basically looking at other people's stuff. And then uh, there's this top, I don't know, 210, 2% or whatever that are doing almost all of the postings. And you can kind of describe it with a rational function as it starts heading towards an asymptote. Not completely there, though. Um, I think the one thing that I, that I wasn't expecting on coming across here uh, with this uh, talk in a way is how students learn in concrete terms. And I think that would help us to make mathematics more inclusive. Uh, a little example, I, I was at a group, uh, and you've all been there, uh, and you talk to somebody and they ask you, what are you doing? And I say, well, I teach math. And then the next line is, well, I was never very good at math when I was a kid. But then what happened is, is he came along and he started to say, well, you know, it's interesting because now I like math because he started working with sheet metal. And it was a concrete thing and it's, it's actually sheet metal, bending it into three-dimensional forms was a little bit difficult to do and he ended up starting to understand the math because he worked with something that was concrete. So the concrete ideas became the vehicle for the abstract concepts. And of course, math is changing here. You know, in my day when I was growing up and that, it was, you know, 2% knew it, math, that was fine. We had PhDs when I was coming out of college, with PhDs in physics and math that were driving truck. There wasn't sort of this demand at that time for it. But now it has really changed because, you know, the people have been, uh, replaced by robots, but now we need people who are, know enough math to run the robots. That gets to be, and they need to know a little bit of number sense. And by 2018, it's projected that there'll be eight million jobs available for like STEM students. Um, Non-STEM students, I think more and more in the social sciences, social media, there's gonna be more need for people to take math. This is a little quote by uh, the CEO of Slide. He has a social media company and what he said is our competitive advantage is actually our math skills. 
which is probably not something you would expect from a media company. And I thought that was very interesting because there's so many students that think, oh, I'm gonna go into social media, I don't need to know math. And, and it's, it's, it's really going everywhere. I think what has happened a little bit with mathematics is society needs people to know mathematics. The individual needs mathematics to open doors. Mathematics is what people need and we have it. And so now there's more pressure for change and sometimes it's coming from the external, it's coming from the legislature, whatever it is, but somehow we need to help students learn math better, a bigger percentage of the population. Just want to uh, say some conclusions. I, the, after doing this and doing, uh, working on this, mathematics and the human experience are really, I, in my opinion, inseparable. They really go together. Uh, math helps us discover things, see things, uh, determine possibilities. But the human experience, really, the senses, and that helps us grasp these abstract concepts. It's really how people get at it, and I think it's the way students get at it. And in a way, if I think back, I got at the derivative by a falling ball. You know, that helped me understand the derivative. And I think not recognizing this third point promotes exclusivity. This was a quote by a, um, a reviewer uh, that one time I saw. The, the way this material is presented makes it way too easy. Everybody will get it. Um, I don't know if that, you know, you know what I mean? I'm not sure because, you know, when you think about reading, we kind of expect everybody to get reading, that's okay. Um, but the math has a little different flavor to it, um, with it. And we really need all math, uh, all students to be math literate, obviously. It's starting to get to be more and more. And it isn't, I don't think the secret is to dumb it down, because we have a discipline, and if you don't do the math right, the bridge falls down. So there, there's some real, substance there that needs to be learned. And again, uh, these approaches I think are one way to help people understand these abstract thoughts. This is a quote that I found kind of uh, uh, interesting. It's, and I'll uh, let you read it here. So it's one of those things where I didn't do my dreams because they, I wasn't very good in math, that idea. And it's very unfortunate, and I think it's why what we do is really important as teachers at whatever level. I, I've taught like at seventh grade, I've taught graduate students, and it's all important. And I think one of the biggest and impo most important areas right now is developmental, if that's what you're involved with in these before calculus. Because if they don't get through that, they don't graduate, and they don't get where they want to be. And congratulations for working with that, because I think it's really important to prevent some of this from happening. I think the idea of metaphor does not really diminish mathematics in any way. It's kind of an essential way to understand it. And I think ideally we'd like to have more what intellectual diversity and accessibility in mathematics. Um, I'm going to show a, a little slideshow. Some of you, have, if you've seen some of my presentations, I, I try to put math to music. And um, just I always think things look better when there's music. So this is an attempt at that. I'm just trying to summarize some of the ideas that was in here. And, uh, and it's, uh, I guess I, I hope you enjoy it here with this just a few minutes long.
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You've been a great audience.